Turn with me in your Bibles to Exodus chapter 8. Last time we saw the first of the ten plagues that God would bring against Pharaoh and Egypt and all the people there. And uh, don't ever think that God was, you know, just haphazardly bringing these plagues, plagues against Egypt. But in fact, these plagues are directed uh, specifically at God's the gods, the pagan gods of the Egyptians, the, the gods they worshipped. Uh, these plagues by God as, uh, accomplished a lot of different things, but first of all, uh, they answer Pharaoh's very sarcastic question to Moses, Who is the Lord? You know, in other words, you're my slaves. My gods are better than your God, whoever your God is, Moses. And so he thought, because you're my slaves, I win, your gods lose. And so these plagues would display the power of the one true God, Yahweh, over all these man-made pagan gods that the Egyptians worshipped. So the first plague that we looked at was targeted at the Nile River, all the water of Egypt, turning the water into blood. And this was actually... A plague that came against three of the Egyptian gods. The one that we looked at last time was called Happy, H-A-P-I. Uh, he was the spirit uh, of the Nile River. They have another one, Kanum. I don't know how you pronounce it. K-H-N-U-M. So say it however you like. Kanum. And he was the guardian of the Nile. He's also one of the creators of the world. And then Osiris. Um, some of you have heard of him. He was depicted as having the Nile River as his bloodstream. And so he turns the Nile River into blood. That's what God does. We saw that Pharaoh's heart grew hard. He did not listen to Moses and Aaron. And so he would not let the, the Jewish people go out of Egypt and worship the Lord. Now, not only would these pr plagues prove that Yahweh is the one true God, infinitely superior to all the pagan gods of Egypt, but God was also proving uh, you know, to his people that God is superior, that God loves them, that God has a plan for the Jewish people's lives. As we've seen up to this point, the Jews are beaten down, they're discouraged, they're depressed, they're, they're at the end of their rope, uh, they're mad at Moses because they figure, well, you didn't set us free like you said you would, and, and some things have gotten worse for the Jewish people. Their harsh slavery had got them very discouraged, very depressed. So God was not only telling them that he saw their plight, but he also is showing them the reality of who he is and that he's going to fulfill all the promises he made to their forefathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, over 400 years earlier, to bring them into the promised land. Now, as we come into chapter 8, God is going to bring the second, third, and fourth plagues. Um, I'll try not to laugh at some of these. I mean, but there's the plagues of frogs, lice, and flies. Oh, my. Lions and tigers and bears. Now, some people wonder, why doesn't God just jump ahead to the tenth plague, the death of the firstborn, and wipe out the Egyptians and set his people free? Because God doesn't desire for any to perish. God is not one to condemn. God wants to give them time to repent. God is being patient with them. 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 9, a verse many of you know, The Lord is not slack or slow concerning His promises. Some count slackness, but is long-suffering or patient toward us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. And so again, by dragging these plagues out, God is being gracious to the people. He's giving them time to repent. He's giving them time to turn to the one true God. And so he doesn't start with death, but he's going to bring uh, frogs. So that'll get their attention. Now, a couple of things we'll see as we go through these plagues is that God is very good at tearing down, bringing down your idols. Whatever you place alongside of God or before God, God has a way of tearing it down. He did it in Egypt. He's done it throughout history. He's still doing that today. Whatever the people of this world worship and bow down to, God will eventually come against it and tear it down. 
Think of all the hard-hearted, pharaoh-like people in the world in our culture today. So many are proud. So many are arrogant. They don't even realize that they're fighting against God, but it's a battle that they will eventually lose. But look at everything in this world that is contrary to the Lord today, contrary to His Word. So many people are blatantly rejecting the truth of God's Word. More and more people are looking at Christians as the problem. You know, we stand up for Jesus. We stand for the Word of God. We stand for biblical marriage. We stand for one man, one woman united together in marriage. We stand for the sanctity of life. So many other things. But the world is just 180 degree opposite of what the Bible says. The sad thing is, the more they mock God, the more they mock His Word and reject Christ as Lord, uh, the direction they choose, the lifestyle they embrace, it only brings them into further uh, deception, further bondage, eventually emptiness and despair, and ultimately their destruction. Even though the world is in a literal crisis right now, they're too proud, too arrogant to humble themselves before God and ask the Lord to forgive them and to seek Him because His ways are the best ways to live. So reason and rational thought that comes from God's Word, it's, be, it's been replaced by humanistic belief, humanistic you know, endeavors. Uh, they have the mindset of the people in the book of Judges where everyone is doing what's right in their own eyes instead of what God says is right. Now it's in Micah 6, 8, we're all told how to live. It says, He has shown you, O man, what is good, and what does the Lord require of you, but to do justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God. Now, another important thing that we're going to see with Pharaoh is that he tries to get the people of uh, Israel, the Jews, to compromise in their relationship with God. In other words, he'll seem to be giving in to God's demands, you know, he'll say, okay, I'll let you go, but only so far. I'm not going to let you go all the way out there with the Lord, but you have to stay in Egypt. And that's compromise. In other words, if Satan loses your soul and Jesus now owns you, then Satan knows he's lost your soul. So he'll try to get all Christians to walk in compromise, to you know, think that, well, the battle is over, so it doesn't really matter how you live. He'll say things like, oh, I, I see that you're going to church now. Well, that's wonderful, but you don't have to leave the world behind. You don't have to take this Jesus stuff too seriously. You don't have to stop sinning. Yeah, go to church. That's great. You can go to church on Sunday, but Friday night, Saturday night, that's for us. You know, we'll have a great old time. In fact, here's some churches I recommend. They won't make you feel guilty about sin. They won't make you feel guilty about rebellion against God or, you know, coming against the Word of God. They won't talk about repentance. So here, you know, let me give you a list of churches that you should go to, and you'll feel very comfortable there. That's the strategy of the enemy. He wants to neutralize your effectiveness for the kingdom of God. He doesn't care how he does it. He loses you to Jesus, so he's going to try to neutralize you, make you ineffective for the kingdom of God. But our attitude needs to be, I don't want to live a compromising life. I don't want to live a half-hearted Christian life. I don't want to follow Jesus from a distance or only when it's convenient. But our attitude should be, Lord, take all of me. Transform my life. Use me as a vessel of honor for your glory. I want to walk in the power of the Holy Spirit, not in the weakness of my flesh. And so we're going to look at the chapter 8 this morning. Look at verse 1, and we'll look at the first plague. Oh, boy. And the Lord spoke to Moses, Go to Pharaoh and say to him, Thus says the Lord, Let my people go, that they may serve me. But if you refuse to let them go, behold, I will smite all your territory with frogs. So the river shall bring forth frogs abundantly, that's not abundant life. That's abundant ribbit. You know, that's not what you want. We shall go up and come into your house, into your bedroom, on your bed, into the houses of your servants, on your people, into your ovens, and into your kneading bowls. 
Yeah, I'm whipping up some eggs here. Well, what's this green stuff in here? <laughs> right before lunch, that's good. And the frog shall come up on you, on your people, and on all your servants. And the Lord spoke to Moses, Say to Aaron, Stretch out your hand with your rod over the streams, over the rivers, over the ponds, and cause frogs to come up on the land of Egypt. So Aaron stretched out his hand over the waters of Egypt, and the frogs came up and covered the land of Egypt. I don't know why, but the magicians did so with their enchantments and brought up frogs on the land of Egypt. And so what a crazy scene. I mean, literally frogs everywhere. Frogs blanketed the people's homes, their bedrooms, their beds, their the bowls. I mean, everywhere. Again, why would God cover Egypt with frogs? Simple answer is, this was one of their gods that they worshipped frogs. Literally, it was a goddess. Uh, her name was Hect, H-E-Q-T. She had this beautiful body of this sleek woman and a big frog head. She was married to Kanum, remember the god of the Nile, the creator uh, of the world in their minds. And I'm thinking, well, that should prove right there that this is so ridiculous. This is just a man made up religious system, you know, a God that creates for his wife. I mean, can you imagine if you had the power to create, you would create this beautiful woman to be your wife, and you lift up the veil on your wedding day, and it's a frog head, you go, what the heck? <laughs> Maybe that's where she got her name, Hecht. What the heck? Oh, man. Bad delivery or something. First service got it quicker than you guys. That's the rest of the story. But this we do know about this ugly goddess. Uh, she was worshipped as a goddess uh, of um, conception and fertility. And so that means that to the Egyptians, she was sacred. So you could not kill frogs. They were sacred. It's like how the Hindus, when you're in India, you see all these cows wandering around, even on the freeways. They will not kill cows because the cows are sacred. So to me, this is kind of funny. It's almost as if God is saying, oh, you worship frogs and you can't kill them? Well, here you go. All the frogs come out of the rivers, the lakes, the ponds, everywhere. God covers the land. I mean, just think of billions of frogs throughout Egypt. Once again, the Egyptian sorcerers could only duplicate what God is doing here. They couldn't take away. You think if they had any real power, they'd make the frogs go away. But all they do is make it worse. But that's what Satan always does. He promises all this stuff, but he can only make things worse. Well, look at verse 8. Then Pharaoh called for Moses and Aaron and said, Entreat to the Lord that he may take away the frogs from me and from my people. And I will let the people go, that they may sacrifice to the Lord. And Moses said to Pharaoh, Accept the honor of saying, When I shall intercede for you, for your servants and for your people, to destroy the frogs from you and your houses, that they may remain in the river only. So he said, Tomorrow. And he said, Let it be according to your word, that you may know that there is no one like the Lord our God. And the frog shall depart from you, from your houses, from your servants, and from your people. They shall remain in the river only. This is one of the most amazing and classic answers in the Bible. Here, you know, there's disgusting frogs everywhere. They're in your house, they're in your bowl, they're in your bed. They're everywhere. You're stepping on them at night when you're trying to get up and do something. It's a squish, squish, ribbit, squish, squish, and I'll croak and all that. And it's just gross. Well, when do you want me to get rid of them? I'll give you that honor. Accept the honor, Pharaoh. Tell me when. Tomorrow. Are you kidding me? Why not now? Like, get rid of them right now, immediately. Pharaoh just asked Moses to pray to the Lord. Accept this honor? Well, tomorrow sounds good. Many years ago, John Corson, some of you know John Corson up in uh, Applegate, Oregon, did a great teaching that he called One More Night with the Frogs. And it was a great message. Basically, he talked about Pharaoh's attitude being so much like the people's attitudes today. 
In other words, there are a number of things in this world that we can get involved with, attitudes and activities and habits, and even things that seem harmless in the beginning, but over time, they can become very harmful. They'll bring people into bondage. You know, it could start off as, well, a little bit of alcohol here, a little bit of drugs there, a little bit of, uh, you know, compromising relationship here. Uh, maybe, you know, it's not really pornographic. I mean, they're mostly dressed. You might think, this isn't all that bad, and I'm not really hurting anyone. Be careful. Those little frogs are about, about to hop out of the river, and pretty soon you may find yourself in a nasty situation. Now you're being plagued by the frogs. And here's the important thing to remember in all this. If you ever find yourself being overrun by the so-called frogs of the world around you, when God says, when do you want me to deal with this problem, this issue in your life? Don't be like Pharaoh. Don't say tomorrow. Say, Lord, right now. I need to deal with this right now. I need to get this out of my life today. Psalm 95, look at these verses, starting in verse 6. It says, Oh, come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord, our Maker. For He is our God, and we are the people of His pasture and the sheep of His hand today, if you hear His voice. Do not harden your hearts as in the rebellion, as in the day of trial in the wilderness. The point is, if you have been struggling with a particular sin, or there's a stronghold in your life, realize this important truth. God is here right now. This is the day He can deliver you. He wants to set you free now, today. This is the time. This is the place. Jesus has all the power you need in order to set you free today. Don't spend another night with the stinky, slimy frogs. That's the point. You can know there's no one like the Lord our God. He does love you. He does care for you. Well, look at verse 12. Then Moses and Aaron went out from Pharaoh, and Moses cried out to the Lord concerning the frogs which he had brought against Pharaoh. So the Lord did according to the word of Moses, and the frogs died out of the houses and <laughs> out of the courtyards and out of the fields. They gathered them together in heaps, and the, Lord, the land stank. And when Pharaoh saw that there was relief, he hardened his heart and did not heed them as the Lord had said. And so all these frogs that are filling up all these houses instantly die when God gives the word, and they, they're just, they croaked, Right? That's obvious. Come on. I had to say that. You're talking about plagues here. You've got to find some humor in this. Anyway, again, they instantly died when God gave the command. Again, this is proof that the one true living God is infinitely more powerful, superior to the pagan goddess Hecht. Now, can you imagine, you know, just the work it took is all these frogs instantly die. Now they're having to scrape them, shovel them out of their houses. And they're just piling them up in these piles outside of all their homes throughout Egypt. That's why it says the land stank. I can only imagine. I mean, Egypt averages one inch of rain a year. It's a hot desert. And you got that many stinking frogs. It's got to be brutal. I mean, I've been around places where they're cleaning fish, and that can be bad enough. But, ah, frogs, they don't taste like chicken. Not in my book. But there's a couple of powerful points we should take note of here. First of all, the sinful deeds of our flesh will amount to nothing more than a big pile of dead frogs. Stinky dead frogs. That's a, a great reminder that those things that we once longed for, lived for, maybe even idolized, amount to nothing more than a big pile of stinky stuff that's a waste of our time and money and resources. The other thing to take note of is this. Be careful. Don't be like Pharaoh. Do not harden your heart after God gives you relief. I mean, how many times, and I've done it, oh, Lord, just get me out of this situation. I promise I'll never do it again. And then the next day it's like, oh, I'm good today. today. And then you start doing it again. Don't tempt the Lord. God, if you just get me out of this, I promise. But as soon as God sends relief, 
and delivers us, sometimes we forget our promise and the frogs start jumping back into our lives. The solution is, do not make promises to God. God doesn't want you to make a promise about anything or any situation. God wants us to stop trying so hard in our own strength to stop sinning, and He wants us to rely on Him. By faith, trust Him that He would give us the grace, the mercy, the, the strength um, to resist the lies of the enemy. Very simple. We have overcoming power that only He can provide. That's how Jesus sets people free. Um, Jesus says this, Luke 9, 23, Then He said to them all, If anyone desires to come after Me, let him deny himself, take up his cross daily, and follow Me. Uh, it was many years ago, Don McClure was teaching at a pastor's conference, and he said, we need to stop trying harder to overcome, and we need to start dying harder to ourselves. You know, the harder we try to stop doing things, the more difficult it becomes because we're trying in our own strength. We need to die to ourselves and let the Holy Spirit work in us and through us, and He gives us all the strength we need to overcome. And it's only as we follow Jesus and receive what He has promised us, if we follow Him by faith, that we will experience genuine freedom from whatever sin has held us in bondage. Jesus says in John 8, starting in verse 31, Then Jesus said to those Jews who believed Him, If you abide in My word, you are My disciples indeed. And you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. Truth, faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God. I need more faith and trust in you, Lord. Well, be in the word of God. It sets you free. Then in verse 36, Jesus says, Therefore, if the Son makes you free, you shall be free indeed. If I had to try to make myself free, I'll find myself back in bondage in no time. And that's true for every human being. Paul tells us this, 1 Corinthians 10, verse 13 and this is for us to hold fast to Jesus, to stand on the Word of God, let the Holy Spirit empower us, because we can resist those lies and temptations. No temptation has overtaken you, except such as is common to man. So, there's only three types of temptation that Satan uses. He's only got three pitches, you might say. Lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, pride of life. Same thing he brought against Adam and Eve in the garden. Same thing the Apostle John speaks of in 1 John chapter 2. Lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, pride of life. So no temptation has overtaken you such as is common in man, but God is faithful, who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able, but with the temptation will also make the way of escape. So if you ever feel like, I'm trapped into this temptation, no, there's a door open. There's a window open. He's got an opening for you. There's a way of escape that you may be able to bear it. You can have victory in Jesus. And so once again, we see that Pharaoh, he's just postponing the inevitable. God is being patient. He's drawing these plagues out, not for approval. So many Christians think, well, I got away with it this time. I guess he's not really going to judge me for this sin. No, it's going to eventually come against you. But if he would just humble himself before the Lord, God would spare him and his nation so much heartache, so much damage. We'll look at verse 16. So the Lord said to Moses, this is the, the next plague, Say to Aaron, stretch out your rod and strike the dust of the land, so that it may become lice throughout all the land of Egypt, and they did so. For Aaron stretched out his hand with his rod and struck the dust of the earth, and it became lice on man and beast. And all the dust of the land became lice throughout all the land of Egypt. Now the magicians so worked with their enchantments to bring forth lice, for whatever stupid reason they wanted to, but they could not take note of that, so there were lice on man and beast. Then the magicians said to Pharaoh, This is the finger of God. But Pharaoh's heart grew hard, and he did not heed them, just as the Lord had said. So, a couple of things to take note here with this plague of lice. 
First of all, we see it comes without warning. Usually God will tell Moses, go to Pharaoh and say, do this or else. And this time he says, just go do it. There's no or else here. Now God in his grace will often give people warning signs before he does something, before he intervenes. But he doesn't have to. God is sovereign. He's God. He can do what he wants, when he wants, how he wants. He doesn't have to give people warning. In his grace, he often gives us warning, but sometimes he'll let you know, hey, you are heading in a bad direction. You need to stop. You need to repent, or else you're going to face dire consequences. How many people abuse God's grace, and they just assume that God really doesn't care that they're crossing the line? Oh, God loves me. His grace allows me to do these things. Be careful. Don't presume upon God's grace. I've said it for years now that Jesus died on the cross and shed his blood to remove sin from you, to forgive you of all your sins, not to allow you to continue in sin. That's an abuse of grace. When you say, oh, God doesn't care how I live my life, be careful. Don't presume upon God's grace. He does not give people a license to sin. One of my favorite verses is Romans 2, verse 4. It says, Or do you despise the riches of His goodness, forbearance, and longsuffering, not knowing that the goodness of God leads you to repentance? Don't despise the riches of God's goodness. Again, surrender your heart fully over to the Lord, knowing that He loves you, knowing that His ways are so much better, so much higher than your ways. Believing verses like Jeremiah 29, 11, where God says, For I know the thoughts that I think towards you, says the Lord, thoughts of peace and not of evil, to give you a future and a hope. That's His thoughts towards us. And so if God is speaking to your heart about anything, about something that needs to change, give it to God today. Don't keep putting it off and putting it off. Tomorrow is not guaranteed. We only have right now, today. He wants to set you free today. He wants to forgive you today. He wants to restore you today. So this plague of lice comes without warning. As he strikes the dust of the ground, (laughs) the dust turns to lice. How many trillions upon trillions of lice must there have been in the land of Egypt? And by the way, these are affecting everybody in Egypt, even the Jewish people. We'll see that it's not until the next one that God will make a distinction. Somebody asked me first service, well, why did the Jews have to go through some of these, you know, you know, plagues, the first three? I think it was God giving them a taste of how bad things can be without the Lord, but also letting him know that when he makes that distinction, you don't have to go through this anymore. I am your God. I am superior to these pagan gods of Egypt. You can be set free today. And it gave them a a yearning, a longing for getting out of Egypt. You know, oftentimes people that go through some very, very hard trials, they're the people you want to ask and, and question and and have them pray for you when you start going through a trial because they've been through it, they've gotten victory over it, and they've seen God's hand at work. So this plague of lice comes without warning. Now, why strike the the ground, you know, the dust? Well, they had another god of soil named Geb, G-E-B, and he was the god of dirt. (laughs) Let's worship dirt. Let's worship Geb crazy. So when Aaron puts his staff out, trillions upon trillions of lice covers the land of Egypt. Now, the root word for lice simply means one that digs in. That's not a pleasant thought. When you hear about lice, man, it's like, ah, I just got itchy all of a sudden, and I don't like lice. I'm sure some of you, I remember when our daughters were little, and they were at, uh, what was it, um, Broadway Elementary School, and we get the phone call, well, one of the kids in your daughter's class had head lice. And we're like, ah, oh, shave their heads, burn their clothes, you know. It's like, oh, we don't lice. But can you imagine all the dust of Egypt turning into lice? And notice again, this time the magicians, the sorcerers could not reproduce this miracle of God 
again, it shows us Satan is limited. He can only do what God allows him to do. So don't ever think that Satan and Jesus are on equal footing, not even close. Jesus is the creator of all things. Satan is a created being. Lucifer was created by Jesus. Jesus is infinitely greater, more powerful than Satan. Don't forget verses like this, 1 John 4, 4. It simply says, You are of God, little children, and have overcome them, because he who is in you, Jesus, is greater than he, Satan, that's in the world. It's very clear. And notice how these magicians even recognize this is the finger of God. And we see that phrase many times in the Bible. That's a great phrase. This is the finger of God, or this is the hand of God. The Bible says God's hand spans the universe. Incredible. Later on in, uh, in Exodus, we're going to see that it was God's finger that wrote the Ten Commandments on the tablet of stones that Moses will bring down from Mount Sinai. Just write it out. What was one of those commandments? You shall have no other gods before me. The finger of God. It was the finger of God that wrote on the wall in Daniel chapter 5 when the wicked King Belshazzar there in Babylon you know, uh, Daniel's an old man. The 70 years are coming close to an end for their captivity. And Belshazzar is using all these implements from the temple. And he's throwing this big drunken party. And then the finger, remember the handwriting on the wall. Mene, mene, tekel you farsen. Simply means your days are numbered. You've been weighed in the balance. You've been found wanting. And that night, Belshazzar died and his kingdom was overthrown by the Medo-Persian Empire. It was the finger of God. Jesus, riding in the dirt. Remember when that woman was caught in adultery, thrown at the feet of Jesus, and they said, Moses commands that we stone such women. What do you say, Jesus? And he sits, you know, keeps riding in the dirt. We don't know what he wrote, but his finger wrote in the dirt. And then, you know, they're pushing in there. You're saying, okay, come on. She should die for this. And then Jesus simply stands up and says, he who was without sin, among you, let him throw the stone at her first. He stoops back down, starts writing in the ground once again, and then it says they all started to leave one by one from the oldest to the youngest. So was he writing their name in a secret sin? Was he writing the Ten Commandments? We don't know. Whatever he wrote, they were convicted and left. And then, I love this part, John 8, starting in verse 10, when Jesus had raised himself up and saw no one but the woman, he said to her, Woman, where are those accusers of yours? Has no one condemned you? She said, No one, Lord. Jesus said to her, Neither do I condemn you. Go and sin no more. Again, for God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world that the world through him might be saved. He didn't come here to condemn you. He came to save you. But he tells her, I don't condemn you, but go and sin no more. He set her free not to continue living in sin. He set her free and says, go and sin no more. And, and so she comes to know Jesus as her Lord and Savior. To me, the greatest picture of God's hands in the Bible is seeing that he allowed his hands to be nailed to the cross as he hung on the cross, taking the penalty in his hands for our sins, shedding his blood as the only acceptable payment for our sins. And even though these pagan sorcerers realize this is the finger of God at work in Egypt, what happens to Pharaoh's heart? It gets harder. He just hardens his heart. That's a warning. Look at the hands of Jesus. Look at the finger of God. Be warned. He loves you. His nail-pierced hands are reaching out to you to receive you to himself. But if you say, I don't want him, eventually you'll be cast into a place of outer darkness. Well, look at verse 20. Here we have the third plague. Frogs and lice and flies. And the Lord said to Moses, Rise early in the morning and stand before Pharaoh as he comes out to the water. Then say to him, Thus says the Lord, let my people go that they may serve me. Or else, 
If you will not let my people go, behold, I will send swarms. Notice over and over again, we're going to see of flies, and it's in italics. So that means it's not in the original Hebrew language here. It just says, I'm going to send swarms. So take note of that as we go through this. I'll send swarms on you and your servants, on your people, and into your houses. The houses of the Egyptians shall be full of swarms of flies, and also the ground on which they stand. And in that day I will set apart the land of Goshen in which my people dwell. So here's God making a distinction that no swarms of flies shall be there in order that you may know that I am the Lord in the midst of the land. I will make a difference between my people and your people. Tomorrow this sh uh, sign shall be. And the Lord did so. Thick swarms of flies came into the house of Pharaoh, into his servants' houses, into all the land of Egypt. The land was corrupted because of the swarms of flies. So again, a, a little shift in the scene here as God makes this distinction between the Egyptians and his people, the Jews. Now God will always make a distinction between the saved and the unsaved. We are his children. We've been adopted into his family. He has given us eternal life. We have been blessed beyond measure. We've been cleansed of all of our sins, all of our unrighteousness. We have this amazing relationship with God. Read, you know, the first four verses of 1 John, where it says, you know, we have this relationship with God and this relationship with you, and that's where we want all of you to have the same relationship that we have with God. That's where our fellowship is with the Lord. Peter says it like this, 1 Peter 2, starting in verse 9, but you are, this is for everybody here that's born again, no matter how you're looking at yourself in the mirror, <laughs> this is your position in Christ. You are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, his own special people, that you may proclaim the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. That's why he's done all these things for us, that we would give him all the praise. We proclaim the praises of Him, of the Lord, who's done this marvelous work in our lives. Who once were not a people, but now, or, but are now the people of God. So we were separated, now we belong to Him. Who had not obtained mercy, but now have obtained mercy. Again, God makes a distinction between His people and the people of this world. Now, did you notice... Again, the word flies in italics, it literally means swarm. So how do they come up with flies here? Were they flies? Yes, they were. How do we know? You've got to read other parts of the word. Psalm 78, verse 45, it tells us, He sent swarms of flies, and that's the Hebrew word for flies, all types of flies. We went camping a few weeks ago in the Incompagre. Remember all the wonderful flies we had up there? Swarms of flies, the ones I didn't, I mean, most of them are just annoying, but the ones that bit, they were those little deer flies, they were nasty. You know, all of a sudden you'd be like, mm, and, ow, on your ankle, you get this swarming fly. Well, that's what he's referring to here, flies that bite. Flies among them which devour them and frogs which destroy them. So these are the biting types of flies. Again, probably trillions of flies and all the people of Egypt, except for the Jewish people. And if swarming flies, biting flies, don't get your attention, I don't know what will, especially when you find out, how come the Jews aren't being attacked? Why aren't they having swarms of flies there? And, and we'll find later on, Pharaoh's going to send people over to Goshen and find out well, what's going on here. How come they're not facing these plagues any longer? So no flies in Goshen. This would be the original no-fly zone. Anyway, I, I'm sorry. Sorry, not sorry. Verse 25, there's a lot of murmuring going on and complaining. We're going to talk about that later on, all the murmuring and complaining. 
Then Pharaoh called for Moses and Aaron, verse 25, go sacrifice to your God in the land. So here's where he's going to compromise. And Moses said, it's not right to do so, for we would be sacrificing the abomination of the Egyptians to the Lord our God, because we're going to sacrifice things that you guys worship. So we've got to go out of the land. If we sacrifice the abomination of the Egyptians before their eyes, then they will not, will they not stone us? We will go three days' journey into the wilderness and sacrifice to the Lord our God as he will command us. So Pharaoh said, I will let you go that you may sacrifice to the Lord your God in the wilderness, only you shall not go very far away. Intercede for me. Then Moses said, Indeed, I am going out from you, and I will entreat the Lord that the swarms of flies may depart tomorrow from Pharaoh from his servants and from his people. But let Pharaoh not deal deceitfully any more in not letting the people go to sacrifice to the Lord. So Moses went out from Pharaoh and entreated the Lord, and the Lord did according to the word of Moses. He removed the swarms of flies from Pharaoh, from his servants and from his people. Not one remained, but Pharaoh hardened his heart at this time also, Neither would he let the people go. So initially he says, okay, you can go. But he thinks he's still in charge, but you can only go so far. That's like the world. You know, Egypt represents the world. The world will say, yeah, you can worship. Just don't get too carried away with this Jesus stuff. Keep Jesus to yourself. Don't talk about Jesus in school. Don't talk about Jesus in your workplace. Just here, be in these four walls. You can talk about Jesus here, but just not out there. That's what the world wants. We're not to compromise. Moses intercedes. His heart becomes harder again. And as I mentioned, the first five times in these five plagues, Pharaoh hardens his heart. He hardens his own heart. He hardens his heart. The last five, then it says, and God hardened Pharaoh's heart. So, don't listen to the world. People will wrongly believe that Jesus is my Savior, but He doesn't need to be the Lord over my life. I'm still in charge. I'm still in control. I still call the shots. But that's a problem with so many Christians and churches today where they think you can have one foot in the world, one foot in the Lord, but they have a form of godliness, Paul says, but they deny the power thereof. We're to walk in the power of the Holy Spirit, not to put a basket over the light. God wants us walking in the light, not in the shadows of compromise. He wants us burning bright, burning hot. He doesn't want us burning out and getting lukewarm. You remember what Jesus said to the church of Laodicea? They were a little bit lukewarm, not on fire for the Lord. He says this, Revelation 3, verses 15 and 16. I love you know, saying this right before lunch. I know your works, that you are neither cold nor hot. If they were cold, then they could get saved. If they were hot, that's where you're on fire for Jesus. But you're not even here neither. I could wish you were cold or hot. So then, because you are lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will vomit you out of my mouth. That's got to be in the top three things you do not want to hear Jesus say to you. I'm going to vomit you out of my mouth. Joshua, I'll close with this. Joshua 24. And, and remember, Joshua and Caleb, the only two that came out of Egypt that were over 20 years old when they come out of Egypt, the only two out of 3 million leave Egypt. They're the only two that were 20 years old and above that went into the promised land. Everybody else died out in the wilderness because of their unbelief. So here's one of the two, Joshua. He says this in Joshua 24, verse 14. Now, therefore, this is the end of his life. Now, therefore, fear the Lord, serve him in sincerity and in truth, and put away the gods which your fathers served on the other side of the river and in Egypt. Serve the Lord, Yahweh. And if it seems evil to you to serve the Lord, Choose for yourselves this day whom you will serve, whether the gods which your fathers served that were on the other side of the river 
or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you dwell. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. You know, we need to ask ourselves, is there anything that I'm doing? Is there anything I'm holding on to that I need to let go? Is there anything that's coming between me and my relationship with Jesus Christ? If the Holy Spirit shows you, just turn it over to the Lord today. Don't keep saying tomorrow, I'll think about it later. No, don't despise the riches of God's goodness. Today, if you hear his voice, get right with the Lord. Don't delay the inevitable because eventually, as Paul says in Galatians, God is not mocked. Whatever man sows, he'll also reap. If you sow to the flesh, you will reap corruption, destruction, discouragement, all kinds of stuff that's not good. You sow to the Spirit, you reap of the Spirit life. Don't wait until things get worse. God wants to transform your life today. Look at his hands, nail-pierced hands reaching out to you. In I, um, Zechariah chapter 13, 12 and 13, the Jews ask their Messiah, where did you get these wounds in your hands? And he says, in the house of my friends. See him today. He loves you. He paid the price for your sins. You don't need to continue to live in misery and compromise. Today is a day that he can set you free, and he alone can do above and beyond all that we could hope or imagine.